Hi, and welcome to this presentation describing the Grok software-defined scale-out tensor streaming processor. Through this talk, I hope to motivate and describe our system from both a chip to a system architecture. This is work done with a, a, a number of collaborators at Grok. I want to acknowledge the team and thank them for their collaboration. It's a big team effort, and we're a startup, and it takes everybody to, to work hard and accomplish big, big goals. So thank you to the broader team. What I hope to do today is to, to give you a background on the TSP microarchitecture to motivate how we build systems from that, to describe that, describe some workloads, and then leave you with a summary of what we just described. What we did is we started by taking a look at the software-defined approach that really re-examines where the software-hardware interfaces are in a multiprocessor. Specifically, we have a static dynamic interface where we have the compile time versus runtime. And we have a hardware-software interface that the ISA, or the instruction set architecture, is responsible for implementing and enforcing. And what we're describing here is, a, is an approach where we turn over more control to the software and use more of the silicon to do, well, hardware things and leave the things that can be done in software where they are best, best served in the software stack. Designing for determinism requires that we make some design choices and really adhere to a design philosophy. We had to make sure that the hardware was completely controllable by the compiler. In other words, it wasn't about abstracting away the details of the hardware. It's about explicitly controlling the underlying hardware. And the compiler has an oracular view of what the hardware is doing at any given cycle. Unlike traditional systems, uh, traditional CPUs, that embrace aggressive out-of-order execution, speculative execution, a lot of techniques to expose additional instruction-level parallelism and memory concurrency in the memory hierarchy. We've taken a different approach. We use just a single flat scratch pad memory that's 220 megabytes, and we allocate tensors in that memory explicitly so the compiler knows where the tensors are and how they're moving on chip. We describe the memory concurrency. There's a, an abundance of memory concurrency that the compiler can take advantage of. We describe that through our partitioned global address space and make that accessible across the entire system. Complexity at the system level often creeps in because these systems grow to be tens of thousands of processing elements, often consisting of heterogeneous components like CPUs, GPUs, smart NICs, FPGAs, all of which have different failure characteristics and performance profiles. As a result, you end up with a lot of performance variation and response time latency variation, for example. And that latency variation ultimately slows down an internet scale application. Anything that requires a, uh, a coordinated effort across the entire machine will ultimately be limited by the worst case latency uh, across the network. So what we did is tried to avoid some of this waste, fraud, and abuse that crops, that crops up at the system level to introduce new techniques that help us load balance the system without the reactivity of adaptive routing and other aggressive techniques at the, at the network level. So let's take a look at the microarchitecture. And we started with this, this concept of a, 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 a homogenous core, each of which contains certain computing elements, an integer, a, a unit, a floating point unit, a load store unit, and a network interface. And we disaggregated those functional units to make them SIMD functional units and lay them out next to each other so that we can control them and take advantage of their spatial locality. And so while this looks a little different than a conventional CPU, it allows us to execute in the same way that conventional CPU breaks down larger instructions into micro ops. Similarly, we're breaking up deep learning operations into their constituent smaller micro operations and executing those as an ensemble, which together accomplish a larger goal. And so if we just take a look at the, at the chip architecture, we can see that the chip is organized in the spatial orientation where we have functional units laid out next to each other and they collaborate with each other by passing operands and results between each other in an efficient way called chaining. We chain the output of one functional unit to the inputs of an adjacent downstream functional unit. 
On the chip, there's a large MXM module, which is our workhorse. It's our matrix unit. It, it contains uh, storage for 409,600 weights. In other words, a lot of weight parameters that we can take advantage of the data parallelism on the chip. What this allows us to do is to provide tremendous compute density with over one teraop per square millimeter of, of silicon area. So if we take a step back and look at the software abstractions this allows us, we have multiple different functional units on the chip. And those are organized into simple building blocks that are uh, 320 elements long. This is the SIMD unit I was referring to. Each SIMD unit is controlled by an instruction dispatch unit, instruction control unit at the bottom of the chip. These functional units are laid out next to each other in the same way that you can think about uh, abstractions or across different classes in software. So there's different, different specializations for these different functional units. We've got an MXM or a matrix unit, a vector unit for pointwise operations, an SXM or switch execution module for data reshaping, and a memory unit to, to handle on-chip memory. These are laid out next to each other and to take advantage of their spatial uh, orientation. So we can stream data on the chip east and west and take advantage of that spatial locality. In a sense, it's capturing the data flow locality that's common in all these machine learning uh, models. What this enables is an ISA that empowers our software stack. We explicitly turn over control to the software, specifically the compiler, so that it can reason about correctness and schedule instructions on the hardware from a first principle standpoint. Specifically, there's 144 on-chip instruction control units, each of which control the dispatch to their functional units that they're associated with. This allows us to keep the hardware overhead of, of dispatch very low, less than 3% of the area is used for uh, instruction decode and dispatch while putting most of the chips uh, area to good use executing functional models. So one of the things is this, this uh, provides a very simple extraction to the, the compiler that each functional unit interacts with a set of stream register files. And these SRFs, as they're called, uh, provide the conduit through which data inputs and data results are communicated to the other functional units. You can think about this as sort of a, a tensor assembly line that connects up the different functional units. And these stream registers are a very simple model for the compiler to reason about. It's only one cycle hop between each stream register. There's no arbiters, no queues, no reordering that's allowed either in load stores or network references. So the compiler truly does have oracular information that it can reason about the correctness of every program it generates. At the heart of this is an instruction set that is a domain specific instruction set for operating on machine learning models. Specifically, we take machine learning operations like Conf2D and we break them down into an ensemble of micro instructions that are executed across the, the chip at each different functional unit. They cooperate to produce this higher level instruction like a conf2d or a maxing max pool operation and the the instructions are broken down in their different uh, instruction set according to each functional unit the data types supported by the hardware natively are both int assigned and unsigned int 8 as well as floating point 16 so half precision floating point in addition the the vector unit the vector processor that does pointwise elements supports a superset of that, including FP32. So if we just take a look at the functional units, every functional unit has a certain number of compulsory instructions, namely instruction fetching, no opping, and synchronization. And these are the fundamental instructions necessary to coordinate the execution. At the heart of the chip is our matrix multiply unit. The matrix engine, operates by having a 320 element vector and there's 320 features in each matrix, giving a 320 by 320 integer operation. For floating point operations, we can do 320 by 160. This allows us to, to handle both integer and floating point. Floating point is a little unique since a pair of, of byte planes 
cooperate to produce one FP16 output. In the center of a chip is our vector execution module, or VXM. It's the vector pointwise operations that are common in machine learning models. For example, GALU or RELU uh, are, are common, as well as other transcendental functions uh, are present in the vector unit to take advantage of uh, pointwise operations. Each vector lane supports 16 ALUs, and that's connected up to our on-chip memory in SRAM through our memory functional unit. The memory functional unit has 88 slices in, uh, in, in, across the chip, each of which can do one read and one write. So in principle, the memory system supports up to 176 way concurrent execution. That's a tremendous amount of memory concurrency to, to exploit. And then lastly, at the SXM is our switch, our switch execution module. And the SXM provides kind of the Swiss army knife, data manipulation, data reshaping, on-chip data movements and off-chip data movements. As we see here, this is referencing our chip-to-chip -chip or C-to-CIO, including PCIe is also handled by this the SSX, SXM unit. So let's take a, a step back and see how we package this all together to create systems from these components. We first start with the Grok chip, which I just briefly described. That's packaged with a heat sink on a card, and we package eight of those cards into a Grok node. We then package eight plus one spare into a Grok rack and make that accessible in the cloud. This scale-out organization is quite unique. Number one, it takes advantage of the packaging hierarchy to make a low diameter network. This is taking advantage of the Dragonfly topology, which exploits packaging locality. It creates what we call a software scheduled direct network. And it allows us to really put our foot on the gas and communicate to 16 directly attached chip to chip links on each TSP. The scale out organization takes advantage of a low network diameter to pack as many as uh, eight of our chips into a single node. And those eight chips are connected to their seven peers using 28 cables that are tucked in underneath the hood of each node. That allows us to richly connect up the eight TSPs within a node to, again, take advantage of packaging locality. These nodes are connected using electrical cabling and the longer cables will use optical cabling between racks, rack to rack network. The Dragonfly topology is a hierarchical topology. It first builds a group by, by recognizing that these eight TSPs together um, each expose four global ports. So eight times four is 32, 32 virtual ports that are used to connect up the global system. And that allows us to connect up to, thir to 32 peer nodes for a total of 264 TSPs in a single system. We can extend this idea and make the rack our local group, in which case we'd be able to connect up to 145 racks in the system for a total scalability of over 10,000 TSPs in the system. Rock scale out topology uses the Dragonfly to fully connect the set of eight global nodes within the rack, as shown here in this diagram. It allows us to have a spare node to use as an as a hot spare and take advantage of edge and node symmetry in the network to be able to uh, provide N plus one redundancy and improve the system resilience as a result. At the heart of the system organization is a globally synchronized network. Now, of course, the network isn't truly synchronous in that there's not a global clock going to every node in the system. We provide the illusion of synchronous behavior. In particular, uh, we use a, a, a series of hardware and software techniques, a hardware alignment counter and a software alignment counter that allows us to detect when drift occurs and compensate for that drift. The network is composed of plesiochronous links, which means that they're mostly synchronous. They're synchronous within the tolerance of the clock and the clock crystal that's driving each link. So we take advantage of that and we're able to detect when that drift happens and compensate for it through a, a series of hardware and software techniques. Again, this is an area that we had to identify and enable ISA support to be able to de-skew those chip-to-chip links. So there's specific instruction support 
to allow us to de-skew those links. In addition, links are, instead of hardware flow control, they're software flow controlled. They're paced, and software paces the links to ensure that they never overflow or underrun any of the links. At the heart of this, we rely on forward error correction so that we can have a fixed latency across every network link. And this is what allows the compiler to be able to reason about the time in flight and to reason about how long it takes for a message to arrive at its destination. Conceptually, when the machine comes out of reset, there is some initial independent, these counters are initially independent of one another, and we bring them into lockstep. And they may drift slightly over time, but from time to time, we de-skew them and bring them back into lockstep. And this is how we maintain that illusion of synchronous behavior across the distributed system. So unlike conventional networks that really have uh, rely on a hardware arbitration scheme to, to dynamically contend for a set of output ports, we take a different approach in that we make all the physical network ports schedulable by the compiler. The compiler can literally schedule the network links just like it would schedule an ALU or a matrix unit. This alleviates some of the more conventional approaches that are reacting to congestion in the network. Instead of reacting to that congestion and doing adaptive routing to try to ameliorate the hotspots that result from contention, we instead take a first principles approach of avoiding the contention altogether and spreading the traffic pattern across the available path diversity in the network to expose and take advantage of the additional bisection bandwidth. One of the things that this allows us to do is to treat the tensors as a message. In other words, we're, we're routing vectors as our packets, and those vectors occur back to back in time as a contiguous stream of vectors forming a tensor. And that allows us to frame a message as a sequence of vectors. This allows us to encode a, a message on the network very efficiently with only two and a half percent encoding overhead. At the heart of this, we want to take advantage of both minimal and non-minimal routing. Every TSP in the system has exactly one minimal path between every source destination pair. However, there are lots of non-minimal paths. For example, if we wanted to route from TSP0 to TSP3, there's one minimal path, but there's many non-minimal paths. And the software, the compiler in this case, can look at the size of the tensor and decide how many how many uh, paths across which to spread that to minimize the serialization latency as it travels across the network. This allows us to do what's called deterministic load balancing instead of the, uh, the more conventional approach of adaptive routing, adapting or reacting to congestion in the network. That has its own problems since you can only see a small sliver of the network at any one time. You're only looking at the congestive state of your output ports and that can lead you to, to make a bad decision or a bad routing decision and choose a, a, non, a, a bad path that might be more congested than the one that you're, you're routing away from. This approach has some wonderful trade-offs. It allows the compiler to load balance all the physical links, just like we would any other functional unit on the chip. At the heart of our chip-to-chip -chip links is a, a simplified communication protocol and flow control. The flow control, as I mentioned, is explicitly driven by software. There's no hardware flow control. So software must ensure that they don't overflow or underflow the C to C links. And that's done again as a, as a matter of principle, making determinism a, a first, a first principle, a cornerstone of the design. If we look at a traditional RDMA kind of request where we're issuing a read to a, a destination and that read is going to cause a uh, memory transaction that will then flow the reply back across the network where it can later be used. A much more simplified version of this is where the compiler knows the address that's being read and the data is simply pushed across the network at the time it's needed so that it can be consumed at the source. This allows for a much more efficient network transaction with less messages on the network and less overhead. We take advantage of redundancy within the TSP and within the network and the system as a whole. For example, 
For yield recovery, the chip is actually constructed from 21 super lanes, of which we only use 20. So we can tolerate one bad super lane as a matter of manufacturing yield. This allows us to hide that, that spare super lane from the compiler. This is the one area in which we actually do hide the hardware details. It enables us to use an all good chip uh, to, to be able to tolerate some amount of defects that may appear in the field. In addition, a redundant power supply and a redundant node within each rack provide additional redundancy. Not only that, but determinism simplifies and improves the ASIC design process. Design and verification can be expressed through a number of assumptions that the hardware and software need to ensure and guarantees that the hardware and software need to be, make sure that each other are, are uh, validating. For example, any guarantees that the hardware is making need to be validated as software assumptions. The software stack plays an important role for our reliability and redundancy. Specifically, the exception handling is taken care of at the runtime level. This is why the forward error correction is needed on all the links. If we encounter an error, it requires a replay, a software replay, and that is handled through the runtime. To protect all the on-chip data structures, we use SecDead or single error correction, double error detection to protect all of the data paths, all the stream registers, all the instruction buffers and instruction queues on the chip. We call this kind of approach ECC everywhere for obvious reasons. Now that overhead is easily amortized and we can, we can take advantage of that. Um, and, and it pays to be a little bit paranoid here. As you can see, silent data corruption does happen as some of my former colleagues from Google have published in their paper, cores that don't count. It's important that we be good stewards of our customers' data. So we protect all the critical hardware structures. In this diagram, every one of these gray boxes that are numbered are the stream registers. Those are strongly protected with SecDead. And that's important as we want to, uh, again, preserve the pro and protect the tensors as they flow across the chip. In addition, we want to provide exception handling to avoid common things like arithmetic exceptions. Uh, arithmetic overflow or underflow that may result uh, is handled a priori by deciding the exception semantics ahead of time. For example, the compiler can avoid any overflows, arithmetic overflows, by using the saturating instructions like add saturate, subtract with saturate, or multiply and saturate. That allows us to avoid having a, a value spill over and uh, go from a very big value to a very tiny value as it overflowed the, the bit precision. So if we look at our workloads that we're uniquely capable at, um, they, they tend to all be related to linear algebra since that's the workhorse of machine learning as well as a lot of HPC codes. To give an example of this, we look at Cholesky factorization using a block cyclic de decomposition to spread the the triangular elements across multiple chips. We achieve state-of-the-art results across both BERT and BERT large on, on the TSP, as well as demonstrate how a general matrix multiply can be done really efficiently. And then lastly, all these benefits really come to fruition when we put the pedal to the metal for communication. In particular, we see that even though we have less pin bandwidth than a competitive chip, we're able to take better use of that pin bandwidth and take advantage of fine grain communication. In other words, small tensors can be very efficient on this network. Lastly, I want to leave you with a few summary and takeaway points. First of which is all of this was intended to enable the compiler, make the compilation process efficient and lightweight. And this is evident by the progress that the compiler has made, the rapid progress that we've made being able to compile more generally a variety of different models that have a variety of different types of operations. So if we look at this more broadly, what we're trying to accomplish is predictable and repeatable performance that provides low latency and high throughput across the entire system. Determinism enables this software-defined hardware approach. We're not about abstracting away the details, we're about controlling the hardware underneath. And we want to do that by exposing the right set of architecturally visible state, turning that over to the compiler so that it can reason about correctness 
from first principles, making software and exception handling handled at the compile time and at runtime, respectively. And lastly, we enable this synchronous communication model, which allows us to do lock-free communication across very large systems. And that's a real superpower that we hope you'll be able to take advantage of. Thank you for your time and thank you for your attention. We hope you'll reach out to us at Grok and we are hiring if anyone is interested.